Now, some of you may be wondering, well, what am I thankful for? I'm going to give you something you can be thankful for. I want everybody to take a deep breath right now. <gasps> now breathe out. <sighs> Do you know what they call that? They call that grace. The fact that you are breathing, you are alive, that is something to be thankful to Jesus for. Amen? Amen. I'm excited about today's presentation. It's called Ladder Rain Power, and we're going to be taking a good look in the Scriptures regarding the Holy Spirit, regarding the Holy Spirit. You know, let me tell you a story. It's a little bit of a parable. Not sure if it's true, but either way, the lesson is still present. It's the story of a man who got lost in a desert, and as he was walking just this barren waste field. You could see the vulture circling overhead, looking off in the distance, nothing but a plane. He could see cactuses, and it was just getting hotter and hotter and hotter, a little bit like Fresno, right? And it was just getting hotter and hotter. He was just sweating. He was thirsty, and he was taking off parts of his clothes. It was just getting so hot. He was completely dehydrated. And finally, he looks off in the distance, and there he sees a signpost with an arrow that is pointed down. He gets there closer and closer, hoping to find something. And as he gets there, he looks. It's just an arrow pointing into the ground. He begins to move the sand around, and there he finds a water bottle. But the water bottle has a note. And attached to that water bottle is a note that says, Five feet from this to the right, there is a pump. But you need to dig out the pump, and you will get all the water you need. However, this one water bottle, bottle must be used to prime the pump. And when you are done getting all the water that you need, fill up that water bottle and put it right back in its place for the next traveler. Now, friends, what would you do? You are thirsty. You are dehydrated. If you use up that entire water in that bottle, that means there potentially there may not be no water left if that well is dry. However, if that water bottle you've used up to prime that pump, you could get all the water that you would need. Now, that's a question for you to think about. You know, in our world today, there are a lot of people who are thirsty. In our world today, there are a lot of people who are dry, spiritually dehydrated, and they are looking for answers, things that will satisfy their souls. You know, something that is common in Hollywood right now, it's a trend that's been going on more and more. We see a lot of people get in Hollywood or, you know, let's say when it comes to singing or whatever you want to call it, and as they gain this celebrity status, their hearts are more and more empty. And so uh, they gain more wealth. And as they gain more wealth, they realize that doesn't satisfy. So you know what's done next? Then they get into multiple kinds of relationships. And then it's different kinds of relationships, alternative kinds of relationships they get into. It doesn't stop there. The thirst becomes greater and greater. And soon, experimentation with drugs takes place. It doesn't stop. Soon there are addictions. There are various kinds of experiences that they begin to have. And finally, the end result is suicide. And friends, this is something that is a common thing that has been taking place over and over and over again. In our world today, there are a lot of people that are thirsting for something, that are wanting something, and really quite not sure exactly what it is. But the problem is this, friends. When that same experience out in the world is taking place inside the church. Where it's not just the world that is thirsting, it's God's own people. Amen? Do you know one of the very last appeals found in the book of Revelation is this, that if any man is athirst, the spirit and the bride say, come. Even God understands this world and the condition that is in this world. This message is going to be taking a good look on how we can satisfy that thirst that nothing else in the world can really do. You know, when I first became a Christian, I was so excited about the three angels' message, so excited about preaching the gospel, so excited about seeing the church active and alive. Nothing like the church here, but the church that I had was a completely different experience. In fact, you hear these kinds of 
experiences, but they actually happen. Even the day I got baptized, I walked up to a church member and he said these words, don't worry, you'll become like us soon enough. You know, and so I was just blown away by the things that were happening. I was super excited. I wanted more people to be excited about the second coming of Jesus. But I couldn't understand why when you have such a powerful message, the church was in this kind of condition. And so one day, I decided at potluck, you know, I love potluck, I call it the second service, right? I was taking a journey around potluck, and I was talking to different people, and I asked the question, how do you think the work is going to be finished up? How do you think God's going to empower the church to finish the work? One lady, she said these words, when the church changes its stances on music, then it'll wake up and the end will come. And I thought to myself, out of all the issues in which the great controversy reveals, this is the climax, huh? I went to somebody else. She said these words. She said, well, when the pastor stopped being lazy, then we know the church is going to wake up. And I thought to myself, really, this is how the great controversy climaxes around this. And I went from person to person. No question. I mean, I really did this person to person. And every one of their answers really didn't satisfy the question. None of these answers were enough to just satisfy my own heart. Yeah, that's it. And I be begin to wonder, wait a minute, how in the world is the work going to be finished? Because we've been at this for a long time. Something took place a few years later in which God began to answer this question. I went to India, and I would go to India occasionally about once a year, and I would speak at this school. There was about a 1,000 Hindus, Muslims, and Christians there. And one day when I was preaching, I went back to the president of the school's, his house. I'd give, go back there, and I'd have dinner with him and some of the team members that I came with. And as I went there, I never forgot, we just preached, went to the house, ate some food, and then all of a sudden, the principal gets a phone call. He said, okay, yep, all right, I'm taking off. He takes off very abruptly, comes back later on about 40, 45 minutes. And I said, what happened? He said, well, right after you preached in the girls' dormitory, one of the girls, she was demon-possessed. She got on all fours, was barking like a dog. She was scaring everybody. It was just in a very unusual scene. We prayed. You know, we ask God to step in, and, you know, in Indian people, they're just like, yeah, it's done, you know. <laughs> and so he was there. He was telling me this, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, you know. And, and he then said this sort of just remark, just off the quip. He just said these words. He said, oh, yeah, and it said one more thing. I said, what? He said, he's going to come back into this girl. And then I said these most unusual words. I still sometimes wonder why I said but I said, hey, next time it happens, you bring me. Sure enough, three days later, I was preaching. I was preaching. We were done. We went right back to the president's house, and we were eating dinner. All of a sudden, he gets this phone call, and my stomach just dropped at that very moment because I knew what it was. And he said, yeah, okay, we're going over there right now, and Pastor Nell's coming with me. He got off the phone. He said, yep, girl's having the exact same problem. Let's go over there. And at that moment, I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, I wish I never watched those horror movies growing up. Because every single one of them, no joke, flash through my mind. And I thought to myself, what's this going to look like? In fact, I had a lot of my team members there. Some of them were high schoolers. They were looking at me, and I was like, i got to be brave. And the Lord gave me encouragement because I picked up the Bible, and I just sort of was looking for some encouragement. So I kind of like plopped it to the side, and it said these powerful words. The disciple said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And I said, all right, let's go. So... Myself, the president, we took this long walk to the girls' dormitory. Got to the girls' dormitory. Everything seemed to be okay. There was one room in which the girls were singing and praying, and then there was another room in which there was a circle of these teenage girls and one older girl. And in the middle, there was a young girl who was being held by another female student. Everything seemed to be okay. I thought, no, it's not really that big of a problem. And I was, as I was there, the president gets another phone call. He had to attend to another school matter real quickly. And so I'm just there looking around, and I could hear them, 
And what they were doing in that circle, they were praying and they were reading Psalms 23. They were speaking in English. The older girl was reading. Now repeat after me Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And the younger girl she was holding would say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. Right? And as she began to go through Psalms 23, all of a sudden it gets to the part where this is what, exactly what happened. I won't go into too much details. But she said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And the young girl said, uh, uh. the older girl said, please say it again. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The younger girl said, uh, uh. And all of a sudden, this young girl falls backwards, and the most strangest things start happening. She's kicking off all these girls. She's speaking really weird. We come running in. The principal gets off the phone. We come running in. And this young girl, for a young, skinny little girl, she was kicking people off her. Things were coming out of her mouth that I didn't think was possible from a girl that age. And as we began to pray and just ask God to intervene, her body cringed, tightened up really tight, and then just relaxed. And she fell down to the ground. We lifted her back up and started talking to her, and she was back to herself. And the principal was talking, and he said, where did this thing come from? And she hesitantly pointed to the window. And uh, it was amazing because God did some amazing things in that girl's life. She was actually baptized not too long after that. But as I went back, I never forgot that very night, I went back to the place where I was staying, and my roommate was sleeping. I kept waking him up. What are you doing today? You know, how are you doing, right? I just kept waking up because all these images were flashing through my mind at that moment, you know? Well, the point of this story is very simple. I came to the very end of it, and I thought to myself, well, that was very strange. Went back to America, and I thought that whole thing, that was unusual. And I began to recall certain details of that experience. I mean, it was a very unusual experience. I felt like the great controversy was right before my very eyes. But the part that was strange was the part about the demon not able to recite Psalms 23, specifically the part that has to do with thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. And so I began to do a study on the rod and the staff. And I thought to myself, man, I wonder what the rod and the staff represent in Scripture. And as I began to do a study of the symbolism that is associated throughout the Old Testament, this idea of the Holy Spirit began to merge. For example, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Who's called the comforter in Scripture? The Holy Spirit, right? Do you remember Aaron's rod that budded, right? Because it was an indication the Spirit of God had called Aaron, right, to leadership. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then you know the kingdom of God is upon you. In other words, the Spirit of God was the active agent in the great controversy. When you take a good look at even the, the most holy place, you find three articles of furniture, right? You find the rod that budded. You find the pot of manna, and then you find the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, a symbol of the Father's throne of righteousness. The pot of manna. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The Holy Spirit that budded. The fruits of the Spirit. Friends, over and over again, you can see this idea, and it just began to point me in the direction that I needed to study out the Spirit of God more. And thus began this study about the Spirit of God. Do you know, in the Bible... From the book of Genesis, we are introduced to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is simply understood as this force or thing or this merely just this kind of um, uh, ambiguous thing that God sends upon us. But friends, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to this world. You know, Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit and he said, I have many things to share with you, but you cannot bear them. The Holy Spirit was active in the book of Genesis, active in the Old Testament, active in the New Testament. And God wants to be even more active through his Holy Spirit in these end times. Friends, before we see the second coming of Jesus, there has to be a second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us something very interesting about the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is actually the word parakletos. That word is such a very unusual word. What it essentially means is this. More than just a comforter, it means 
one who comes up right next to you. That's what it means. One who comes up right next to you. So when Jesus was describing the Holy Spirit, the word parakletos was trying to describe how this member of the Godhead would be one who comes up right next to you. Do you know God gave the greatest gift in his son? Amen? Right? But do you know Jesus' greatest gift to this world was the Holy Spirit? And do you know what the Holy Spirit's greatest gift to this world is? Converted men and women. When you take a good look at what Jesus said, he said, I come and I'll testify of the Father. But then he says, when the Spirit will come, he will testify of me. And so the Spirit of God testifies of Jesus, and the, Jesus testifies of the Father. And in this beautiful triune relationship, we see God forming a divine stepladder to help finite beings grasp an infinite God. You know, in Hinduism, the idea of a personal God just does not exist. The reason why is they, because they believe human vocabulary, human language, is insufficient. It's limited. Therefore, any articulation about God is limited. So knowing God very personally simply does not exist in Hinduism. But the beautiful picture of the triune God forms this divine stepladder where you have the Father representing the source of power and life and love. Then you have Jesus, the very visible example that shows us how to bring worship and honor to God. Then you have the Holy Spirit that dwells deep in our hearts that convicts the mind and the heart of how to follow and love God even more. Can you say amen to that? The Holy Spirit is a very powerful agent. He's given to us as a special gift, and we need to understand this role even more. All right, I need three volunteers really quickly. Three volunteers. Okay, you can raise your hand or I can call on you. Three volunteers. Don't worry, you can stay in your seat. I just need you to raise your hand. Okay, very good. Number two, number three, very good. Can you read for me this verse? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And I want you to see the common denominator. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22. Can you read for me 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5? And then can you read for me Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4? Teen. <laughs> All right. If you could do me a favor as much as possible, just stand and read it in the nice evangelistic voice. Now, I want you to hear this, everybody, if you're not looking at the verse. Yeah. Yep, chapter 1, verse 22. Okay, very good. Okay, and the last one right here, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, okay, right? I can't see the verse with this. That's okay, Ephesians 1, verse 14. Oh, um, okay, here we are, 14, oops, sorry. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. What is the common denominator? A description that's given about the Holy Spirit. He's our what? Guarantee. Does anybody have any other translations on that word? Instead of the word guarantee? Earnest? What else? Pledge. Anybody else? Promise? Anybody else? You may see sometimes the word deposit. He's called our deposit. He's called our earnest. He's called our guarantee. That's very strange. God seems to be using financial language to describe the Holy Spirit. Now, what the Bible is talking about is this. Whenever you read the book of Genesis, you find there is something that God does with his people. He connects his people with the land. He connects his people with the what? Land. In other words, there is a connection between the health of the person and the health of the land. 
In other words, as Adam was faithful, the land was good. When Adam fell into sin, what happened to the land? The land fell into chaos, i.e., the current state of our planet, right? When you have the story of Abraham, God told them, right, to be faithful, and he would have the what? The land. In other words, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were doing things they should not be doing, the Bible says the land was defiled. In fact, when those wicked kings were removed, the Bible says the land had the Sabbath. What am I trying to point out? Point, point out this simple fact. As God is to the universe, so his people are to be to this world. As God is to this universe, so his people are to be to this world. Before God allows us into this land of redemption, before God allows us to experience a new creation, he wants to make sure before external creation takes place that there needs to be an internal recreation. The Holy Spirit is given as a deposit to prepare us for heavenly redemption. And that deposit, in a sense, is a kind of guarantee of the land God is going to give to redeemed humanity. Otherwise this, friends, if he puts a corrupt people in heaven, do you know what's going to happen to heaven? It's going to stop being heaven. So what the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is changing us internally to prepare us for the land he is going to redeem externally, i.e. the new heavens and the new earth. The Holy Spirit is this beautiful gift given to change us. You know, I had this very funny incident that took place. I turned on my car one morning, and I noticed that the car was not turning on. And I thought to myself, well, something's obviously wrong. The car's not turning on. None of the lights I could see were on. I thought to myself, well, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I am going to open up the hood, and like every well-meaning male, I'm going to jiggle the wires a little bit, right? Hopefully something works, right? Check the battery. Everything was fine. Called up my friend who's a mechanic, and he says, okay, you do this, you do this. I said, yes. And then he says, is there gas in the car? And I said, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Of course there's gas in the car. Anyways, got off the phone call with him. There was no gas in the car. There was no gas in the car. You would think, <laughs> that's foolish, right? You want to know what's even more foolish than that? Christians who try to be Christians without the Holy Spirit. Christians who try to be Christians faithful to God without the Holy Spirit. Friends, that is the most foolish thing. You see, God has not called you to be a Christian without his help. And one of the reasons why he sends the Holy Spirit is to empower, to change your life, to do a work that you cannot do. Now, friends, I'm going to say something. It's going to be a little raw. There are many ways to commit suicide. You know that? You can take a gun. Suicide can happen. You can hang yourself. Suicide can happen. You can jump off a waterfall. I don't know if that could kill you, but it may be, right? but you can never commit suicide by crucifixion. Somebody else has to help. Friends, nobody can crucify your flesh except for God. He is the agent. He is God's power given to us to put to death the self that is so strong in us. And without the Holy Spirit, there is nothing we can do. We are powerless against this big problem. The Bible teaches us something so interesting. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. Notice this. The first key to being filled is to what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. When you have that hunger and thirst for righteousness, guess what? You can be filled. In fact, I wrote these words, the measure of the Holy Spirit we receive will be proportioned to the measure of our desire and our will.